welcome and thank you for coming to the, this is the fall 2016 Vernon Lecture. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Judy Provencal and I'm the resident astronomer at Mount Cuba Observatory. How many of you have been to Mount Cuba? Oh my, wow, excellent. Well, if you're ever out there again, you might find me poking around in the dome or something. Um, I'm very, very honored tonight to have, to present to you Mike Montgomery, um, who's going to be our speaker for this evening. I've known Mike, I might tell you how old, and tell you how old I am, but a long time, let's say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we met in graduate school, and Mike is one of the foremost theorist, theoretical astronomers, well, you do a little bit of observing as well, so for stellar astronomy. So every time I have a question that I don't know about, I email Mike and say, Mike, what, what's going on here? And he usually can tell me. So Mike got his PhD at Texas. And before that, I'm going backwards in time here, he got his master's degree at Princeton, and then it, he was an undergraduate at Texas as well. So I'm honored tonight to present to you Dr. Mike Montgomery. Let's see. Well, thank you all. Can you hear me? Am I coming through the mic? Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much, Judy, for those kind words. And uh, I have uh, continued to work with Judy over the past, well, unnamed number of years. <laughs> and, um, and I've been to Mount Cuba several times as a result of that. So it's great to be back. It's great to be back here in, uh, in Delaware. And um, I, I'd say I'm very honored to be here as the Vernon Lecturer, because I know some of the lectures you've had previously, and it's, it's great company to be in. So the title of my lecture is Dancing with the Stars. I will not be dancing. That's a good thing. Um, a Celestial Journey in the Milky Way. Uh, and I'm from, as she said, uh, Department of Astronomy and McDonald Observatory at the University of Texas. And I can try this. OK. And of course, I put my name on the last slide. And it's not really fair, because you know, it's in, a, in science these days, it's always a team effort. Um, here's some of our grad students, Thomas Gomez, Mark Schoble. Here's an undergraduate student when she worked with us who's now at uh, Colorado. Um, former grad students, he won a Hubble Fellowship. Uh, and our current students who are uh, working with us right now. And I'll get to this at the end of the talk, but we're also working with uh, scientists at Sandia National Laboratories. And these are some of them. Um, I should have put the Sandia logo on here, I'm sorry. All right, well, I want to talk to you about stars. There's lots of fun things in astronomy, and, but stars are the most basic. Those are the things people noticed the first before we had uh, space telescopes. And I like to think of stars as the fundamental building blocks. So just like atoms are the fundamental building blocks of the world around us, stars are the fundamental building blocks of, of solar systems like our own, of open clusters of stars, which is uh, groups of stars that formed out of a big gas cloud, some of them contain 10,000 stars, of globular clusters, of millions of stars, and of course galaxies like our own, which are in the order of 100 billion stars. So stars are fundamental. Um, but unlike atoms, um, stars are not unchanging. They are born, they burn energy, they burn hydrogen in thermonuclear reactions, then they can burn helium and uh, higher elements. Um, they can run out of this fuel, they can change size, unlike atoms, they change their temperature and they change their luminosity, and they can lose mass or even gain mass in, in uh, some cases. So here you see uh, the Andromeda galaxy, and here's a close-up of the inner region of that, and here's a couple of small satellite galaxies around it. This is one of the more famous images in astronomy that's been known for you know, the last 100 years since people have been able to take photographic images of this. But of course, with our modern equipment, we can now zoom in on, on parts of this and, and see that there really are, of course, lots and lots of stars. Even though this looks like a nice, diffuse um, uh, gray area, it's actually made of millions and billions of stars. Just like the Milky Way that you see at night, when Galileo first pointed his telescope at the Milky Way, he realized, oh my goodness, it's made of stars. Nobody knew that until that moment. So let's look at the life of our sun. So our sun will be born um, over here out of a nebula. A bunch of gas and dust will collapse under its own gravity. 
And as it does so, it heats up. And actually, since it's spinning, it'll form into a pancake shape. And in the center, a star will form. And in the periphery, you may get planets being formed. Eventually, it'll get hot enough that it starts burning hydrogen. And at that point, this energy increases the pressure in it, and it stops collapsing. And so our present day sun is about here at four and a half billion years old. But you can see as time goes on, the sun really doesn't change much. And that's a good thing, you know? Um, the sun we think has only changed how bright it is by about 20 or 30% in the last four and a half billion years. It's one of the interesting things. All of our models of stars say that the sun actually was not as bright four billion years ago as it is today but that the Earth somehow has been about the same temperature. So there must be compensating things in the Earth's atmosphere. In other words, the Earth was holding on to a little more heat four billion years ago so that it was still about the same temperature as it is now. Um, in the far, far future, uh, four or five billion years more in the future, the sun will start to swell up a little bit and things will get very, very hot on the Earth. And eventually when it becomes a red giant, life will not be possible on the Earth anymore. Um, and by the way, this is not to scale. I'm going to show you something that's a little more to scale here. So if this is the inner solar system, there's the sun. There's Mercury, Venus, Earth. When the sun swells up to become a red giant, it's going to, we don't know how big it's going to get exactly. It either will be almost to the Earth or it'll be a little bit beyond the Earth. But either way, the Earth is going to get completely scorched. Now, I have a six-year-old son who's been asking me about this, and he was quite upset, you know, because he said, well, Daddy, if the sun keeps getting bigger, what's going to happen to the Earth? And I said, well, in the distant, distant future, the Earth may get evaporated. And he's like, that's terrible. And I said, yeah, but, but in the distant, distant future, think what awesome spaceships we're going to have. By the time this happens, Pluto is going to be a pretty good destination planet. <laughs> Seriously, it's going to be, you know, it might be 50 degrees on Pluto uh, when this happens. So if, we, if we're able to keep any technology whatsoever, this shouldn't be a terrible problem. So now I'm going to show you a little animation that flies you through this diagram, and it is to scale. And I just like it because it's kind of cool. So as you go along and the sun gets older and older, nothing happens for a while, but then around 9 billion years it starts to swell up. 10 billion years it's even bigger. And you can see when it becomes a red giant, it is really quite a bit larger. So imagine having that in the night sky instead of what we currently have. It would be enormous. So the sun when it gets to be that big is going to be about 2,000 times brighter than it currently is. So the Earth's going to be super hot. Um, but some of the moons in the outer solar system might be pretty nice places to live. All right, well, after this, so the sun's going to swell up and become very large. After this point, it begins losing mass. And in the final analysis, the sun is going to lose about 40% of its mass, 40 or 45%. So it's not a small effect. Um, and as stars lose their mass, they look really nice. <laughs> So these are all stars that have been losing mass, and then they're the last throws of, of mass loss, and they're called planetary nebulae. Now, they're only called planetary nebulae because in the old days, when you look through a telescope, it made a little fuzzy image, and it looked like a planet. It has nothing to do with planets, uh, but it means it's an extended fuzzy object. And all of these things are losing mass. And so if you're looking at this, I think one thing that should occur to you is, that looks complicated because there's obviously not just one way they do it. Here's a whole gallery of them, and they're all different. So I think if I told you that in astronomy, understanding mass loss in stars is something that we can improve upon an awful lot, you would probably believe me because look at this tremendous variety. Um, now, it depends on a lot of things. You can see there's the star that's losing this mass. So these stars lose the mass, and then the star in the center is contracting. It's run out of energy, and it's contracting, but getting very hot as it does it. So not only does it lose the mass, it energizes the gas with high energy photons. So it's like a neon light. So if you were to turn off the star in the center, 
this wouldn't glow anymore. So there's a whole bunch of planetary nebulae out there where their central star has cooled off and we don't see them. So we only see them in this one brief phase. But man, do they look beautiful or what? You guys should go online and there's high resolution images of this where you can see little tiny ripples in the gas moving across. It's really like ripples on the surface of a pond. It's incredible. These are Hubble Space Telescope images. All right, so that's what stars do in sort of a big, big way. Um, if we were biologists, we'd classify things. Uh, and as astronomers, we classify things too. So what we like to do is, you know, instead of sorting things, you know, into taxonomic tables, we say, well, let's sort stars by their color and by how bright they are. And that's called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So this is a little movie, which hopefully will play. What you're looking at is a little section of sky where there's a dwarf galaxy. It's right next to the Milky Way, and so we're looking at all the stars that were in that uh, galaxy. I'm not starting, so it's gonna sort it in there. Then it's gonna show what it looked like when it was first formed, like 13 billion years ago. And I'm not pressing that. And you see the stars all the way across. This is what it looked out one billion years after it was born. As the stars evolve, they change color and brightness and they move away. And so eight billion years in, it looks like that. 10 billion, 12 billion, 13 and a half billion. And this is the way it looks today. So one of the things that, and then this is where the stars really are in space. So one thing that astronomers do is we like to classify stars this way. And by looking at this diagram, we can tell how old the population of stars is by where, what the, where this turnoff is. So that's one way we get ages. So the high mass, high mass stars are the hot blue ones that are really bright. The low mass stars are the cool red ones and they are not bright. These stars, these stars here, are so bright that they are spending energy at such a prodigious rate they don't live very long. So they start out with 10 times the mass of the sun, but they only live like 1 300th as long as the sun does. So these stars die after 30 million years. These stars live for hundreds of billions of years, much longer than the age of the universe. So none of these stars have ever died. Never once, we haven't seen any. Um, and so there's this huge divide in scales. So one thing that's interesting is if you had planets around these stars here, life would only have like 30 million years to evolve. It would have no time. Um, down here, there's plenty of time, but it turns out a lot of these really cool stars have lots of flares and things that we think really wouldn't be that hospitable for life. It turns out that we're kind of in a sweet spot in the middle where the star lives for a long time and is pretty quiet. Um, and maybe that's a coincidence and maybe it's not. So um, if we look at a typical star like the sun, so here's that main sequence I was telling you about. It starts here and after 10 billion years or so, it runs out of fuel, goes up here, starts burning helium, burns helium for a while and then starts losing mass and it makes those pretty pictures and it eventually starts cooling off and it cools off and becomes a white dwarf. And so the things that I have spent the most time studying in my career are the white dwarfs. And you might think, well, they're unremarkable, they're small. It turns out 97% of all stars become white dwarfs. So they're really representative. It's sort of like taking an exit poll of stellar evolution. And so you really learn a lot about stars. You learn that a one solar mass star loses 40% of its mass, but an eight solar mass star loses 80% of its mass, for instance. And of course, the mass that the stars lose in their life can form new stars. So it's a very cyclic thing that goes on. And um, anyway, of course, the ages that we get from all these techniques are model dependent. So we have to have a model that says, well, a one solar mass star really should last for 10 billion years. And a 0.8 solar mass star really should last for 13 billion years. And you may wonder where we get ages in astronomy. Ages are one of the hardest things to get. Distances are hard, ages are hard. So for the sun, we get its age not from the sun, but from meteorites. 
So we assume that the solar system formed at about the same time. So the meteors that fall to Earth, they were formed out of the same stuff the sun was. And we can age date meteorites by looking at radioactive uh, decay in them. And we get an age of about four and a half billion years for the meteorites. So we simply say, yep, yeah, the sun's about four and a half billion years old. That's not, and that's an independent thing. So we have to calibrate our models. We could make a model of the sun that's four billion years old. We can make a model of the sun that's five billion years old. So we have to calibrate it to this. For other stars, you know, we, we may have more trouble doing that. So in the mid 1980s, and I, I, I think we, a lot of us lived through the mid 80s, uh, estimates for the age of the universe were really, really varied from 10 billion years to 25 billion years. I remember reading astronomy books back then, some were saying 30 billion years, 26 billion years. And of course, you know, what's, what's a billion? But, you know, more or less. Uh, many models of stars suggested that the oldest stars in our galaxy, and in the little galaxies around us were 18 billion years old, maybe even 24 billion years old. So you'd say, well, the universe has to be that old. Well, one thing, that we did at Texas is we came up with a different technique. And here's sort of this technique in a nutshell. Um, imagine you have a pot of coffee and it comes out of the Mr. Coffee machine and you set it on a table and you put a thermometer in it. You know it starts off real hot, but pretty quickly it cools off and then it starts cooling off more slowly. And if you were to come back in 20 minutes, it would be say 10 degrees hotter than the rest of the room. And if you came back in a half an hour, it'd be five degrees hotter. And so if you measure how hot your coffee is, you can say, oh, that's how long it's been since it got taken out of the, the coffee maker. We can do the same thing with white dwarf stars. So white dwarf stars are like the centers of red giants. They lose all the mass. And then you have this really hot nugget that's the white dwarf. And so now here's our white dwarf cooling off with time. Except now time isn't measured in minutes, it's measured in billions of years. So it starts off really hot and cools off really fast. But by the time you get down to four or 5,000 degrees for the surface of a white dwarf, it's now 10 billion years old. So if you come in and you see a white dwarf and you measure its temperature, you can figure out how old it is. This is completely independent way of getting ages from the main sequence thing that I showed you before the main sequence turnoff. And so, of course, in science, you want as many different ways as you can to estimate something because there may be problems. You want to know about the problems. So Don Winchett at the University of Texas, back when Judy was a student there, I believe. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There are no dates on here. Don't look at any dates. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Well, I was there just a few years later. So Don Winchett said, well, I've got an independent method for determining the age of the universe. Uh, and he wasn't shy about saying it, and he said, well, we can look at the oldest white dwarf stars in our neighborhood and count how many there are. So there was new data, new data, and this is a weird little plot, but think this is just hotter stars, cooler stars, and this is how many of stars you see. So the number of hot stars is very small. The number of sort of cool stars is larger. The number of really cool stars is larger still, and then if you look cooler, you don't see anything. This kind of makes sense with a cup of coffee. Imagine that you have a person who's randomly taking cups of coffee out of the coffee maker. You know, they wait five minutes, they pull one out, then they wait 20, then they take one out after two. And so you come into the room and there's like 100 cups of coffee. There's a couple of them that are really hot because they just got taken out of the coffee maker. There's kind of more that are mid-range temperature and there's a whole ton that are cool because things cool off slowly when they're cool. And so you, you could make a plot of, of cups of coffee and you get something just like, this, just like this. And if you'd been taking cups of coffee out for days, then as they get cooler and cooler, you'd continue to see more and more. Well, the same thing is true of white dwarf stars. They're being constantly formed over the lifetime of the galaxy. So there's some hot ones and there's cool ones, but there's very few that are super hot because they had to be formed yesterday. Where there's these ones that were formed 100 million years ago, and these there's ones that are formed eight billion years ago. And if the galaxy were infinitely old and had always been uh, forming white dwarfs, this curve would keep going up to the right. And it doesn't. 
Now at the time, people said, yeah, yeah, but that's because these stars are faint and we can't see them. But Don Winget realized, no, no, we actually are sensitive to, enough to them. There just aren't any stars here. And the reason there aren't any stars is because there has not been enough time in the universe for a white dwarf that was born at the beginning to cool off beyond this point. So that's a pretty big statement. Um, and he said, you know, and when we apply that to our galaxy, we get an age between seven and a half billion years and 11 and a half. So it's not real precise, but it's way different than 24 billion years. So Don actually got called up by a leading theorist in stellar astronomy who yelled at him for an hour and then said, you know what, you're right. <laughs> he says, but he said, that's going to be everybody else's reaction because they spent a major part of their career making sure that other number was right and now they're mad. So it turns out that our galaxy really is about 10 billion years old and it formed one or two billion years after the Big Bang. And there's parts of our galaxy called globular clusters that are older. They go back to like 13 billion years or 12 billion years. Um, so it all fits together now. So another reason white dwarfs are good is because the white dwarf age hasn't changed in 30 years, whereas the main sequence evolution age has changed by a factor of two. So that's why we study white dwarfs. We think they're simpler and therefore we can model them better. So the downturn is due to the age of our galaxy. But of course, we want to make this as precise as we can. If we need to really know how fast our white dwarfs are cooling off, is it 7 billion years or is it 11? Um, and so now I'm going to talk to you about pulsating stars. So some of our white dwarfs pulsate. And think of red as dim and blue as hot. So, so this is cool and hot. And the hotter areas are brighter. And so as these pulsations on the surface of the star are occurring, we can't actually see this from light years away. But what we see is the total luminosity of the star goes up and then it goes down. And so you get a sinusoidal signal from the star. And Stars are very complicated. It turns out they can be doing all of these at the same time. In the same way that you can either play one note on a piano, which has a certain pitch, or you can play 10 notes on the piano. Our stars often play 10 or 30 or 50 notes at once. Sometimes they only play one note and it's a very boring song. Um, but our stars do this. Well, why is that interesting? Besides the fact that it's just kind of cool. Um, so how does it help? Well, consider seismology on the Earth. So here's a cross section of the Earth with the different structures in it. And every now and then there's an earthquake. And so if an earthquake occurs here and you have a detector over here, a seismograph, then the wave has to travel through the Earth and then it's recorded at the seismograph. And of course, sometime later, if you have a seismograph over here too, you'll get a wave that gets to it a little later. And if you have a seismograph here, you'll get a signal later still. All right, why is that interesting? Well, a couple of things. First of all, there's two different kinds of waves. There's sound waves that are pressure waves, but there's also shear waves. If you imagine a slinky, stretch a slinky out, you can send a wave like this down the slinky, but if you shake it sideways, you can also send a wave like that down it. Now, those sorts of waves cannot propagate in a liquid. They have to go through a solid. You know, and a solid is springy like a slinky. So what do we really see? Well, if we have, we see the P and the S waves, the pressure and the shear waves here. We also get them here. And over here, we only get the pressure waves. And that's because the shear waves try to go through this liquid region, and they don't. They are, they're reflected there. And so based on this, we know that the Earth has a liquid region in its core. That's the only way we know the Earth has a liquid region in its core. The other thing you can do is how fast the sound waves propagate can tell you how dense the material is. So we actually kind of know the density with depth in a model independent way for the Earth. Okay? Now, this, isn't, this is hard to do because if you're a seismologist, I'm sure you're hugely frustrated by the Pacific Ocean. You can't put any seismographs on the floor of the Pacific Ocean. It's just this big place where you can't do stuff. Um, so it's hard to get as much data as you would like. Well, let's look at the sun. It turns out the sun pulsates in millions of tiny little modes all at once. Um, and here's an example of one of those modes. So there's a lot of light and dark sections here. And you may say, why did I never notice this? 
This is like one part in a million. So we've only been able to measure this the last 20 or 30 years, and the best measurements are from space. Um, but if you can do it, you find out that there's thousands of modes you can easily detect, and there's technically millions of them. And those modes are like waves that propagate down into the sun, are reflected at the surface, and then go back out to the, they're refracted from the center, go back to the surface and reflect and form an interference pattern. And so all the different modes sample the inside of the sun. So we actually know more about the inside of the sun than we do the Earth, because these little modes are like continuous earthquakes. And we can look at the entire surface of the sun, whereas on the Earth we just have a seismograph here, and one here, and one here, and then a huge gap over here, or over here for the Pacific Ocean. So we know an awful lot about the sun. Well, fortunately, white dwarfs also pulsate, not in millions of modes, but in dozens of them. So here's a, a model I made of a pulsating white dwarf a few years ago where blue is hot and red is cool. And unfortunately, you can't see this too well, but at the telescope, you simply see things getting brighter and dimmer. So in time, it goes up like this, and it's actually kind of exciting if you're into it because these things happen on a five to 10 minutes time scale. So you're sitting there watching your star get 20% brighter and I know every now and then when there's a huge one, one of these, I'm like, oh, I hope it doesn't keep going and blow up. <laughs> of course, it never does. But uh, yeah, here comes a big one. Look for a lot of blue. There we go, right in the middle. So, and here's all the frequencies we found in it. There's actually lots more, but here are the main ones. So we can do asteroseismology. When we do seismology on stars, we call it asteroseismology. And we can learn what the interiors of white dwarfs are like by doing that. Let's see. All right, well, how do you get data? You know, as a theorist, you can kind of take data for granted, but actually data is what drives science forward. It's not really brilliant people sitting around dreaming stuff up. Um, it's when you get new data that's better, that's when you make progress. Um, we need a lot of data of these stars. I like to say, imagine that you're, somebody plays the piano and they play 10 notes and you have one second to figure out what all 10 notes are. Imagine, imagine you're some sort of musical genius and you can do that. Um, you probably can't do it in one second. If you let it ring for 10 seconds, maybe. If you let it ring for a half a minute and maybe they play it a few times, you're like, okay, I, I got six of those notes. Well, we do the same thing with our stars. They're pulsating in lots of modes and we have to look at them a long time. So what Ed Nather and Don Winget realized is, well, let's use a bunch of observatories. Because if we use enough observatories around the uh, world, it'll always be nighttime somewhere. And we'll be able to get continuous data. Now, when they first started doing this, this was the late 80s. And I know it's hard to remember back there, but there was no internet. No internet. So I shouldn't say that there was an internet. But you could send email, and you hoped that it would get there. And it might get there a day or two later. And some of them, what they did is they took data, put it on floppies, and mailed them to us. So that's the way we got some of the data. But some of them were actually able to send it, um, or they would have to drive to the nearest town and, and put it on a computer and send it. So anyway, this was the initial thing, and Judy helped um, get this off the ground in the late 80s. Uh, and she is now the, uh, the leader of the Whole Earth Telescope. Uh, so the Whole Earth Telescope is currently run and supported by Judy and Mount Cuba Observatory. Um, and we're actually doing a wet run right now, so Judy is kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's just say doing double duty and not getting very much sleep. Uh, so she's even tireder than I was. And I don't know if anybody saw the baseball game last night, but I had to throw the last pitch. You know, Mike Montgomery got the last out, and uh, I thought that was pretty funny. I couldn't remember who he played for, and then there he was. Anyway, it's a beautiful game. I wish baseball was always like that. Um, so, what have we learned from looking at all these pulsations? Well, we've learned white dwarfs are simple. We kind of knew that, but now we know it. They have an oxygen and carbon core that makes up 99% of their mass. They have this thin veneer of helium, 1%, and then they have a really thin veneer of hydrogen at 0.01%. And you might say, well, isn't that about zero? Why do I even care? Think of the white dwarf as like a hot nugget you take out of the fire, but it's got a thin insulating surface on it. You know, think of something insulating. 
I can't, something rubber. And even though it's a thin surface, it helps keep the heat in. So we need to know how thin this is, how thin the insulating layer is, so that we can tell how fast they cool off. And from the white dwarf pulsations, we've been able to calibrate what this thickness is. And so we now have a very good model for how fast they cool off. We can use it to get accurate ages for things. Um, here's something entertaining that white dwarfs do as they cool off. They have a bunch of nuclei in their centers. It's just carbon nuclei, carbon and oxygen. And all the electrons are knocked off. They're completely ionized. So they're little positive nuclei. They're like little flies that move around. And they electrostatically uh, repel each other. They're getting as far away from each other as they can. So as the star cools off, it actually crystallizes. So when a white dwarf cools off to like 6,000 degrees on the outside, it's still a million degrees on the inside, but it's a crystalline solid. That's kind of remarkable. So this was predicted in the 60s, but we actually have me measurements that show that the stars really are, um, really are, sorry, I just wanted to see the movie again. <laughs> so that the uh, stars really are crystallized. We've even shown that as they crystallize, they release latent heat like ice does. When ice melts, it, um, well, when ice freezes, it has to take up um, extra energy in order to do that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So it's almost like chemistry. But there are still problems. Of course, there's always problems. You never know everything. It'd be really boring if you did. Uh, we have difficulty measuring the masses of white dwarfs. We'd love to be able to do it really accurately, like to less than a percent. But we've used different techniques and we find that there's errors of 10 to 30 percent. So a one solar mass white dwarf might be 1.3 solar masses. That's really not very good. Um, especially because there's these very important phenomena called type 1a supernovae. They're basically white dwarfs that get mass dumped on them until they collapse and they collapse right around when they are 1.4 solar masses. So being able to measure the masses when it's right about 1.4 is really important. Um, and we, are, we don't do a very good job. And we think that part of the problem is the fact that we don't understand the physics of atoms at these higher densities. Sounds silly, um, but, but actually that's probably true. The main way we get masses for white dwarfs is the width of their spectral lines. So here is a toy model of a spectrum. So when you look at a star, you see a bright rainbow, but you also see these dark lines in it. And what's happening at the dark lines is stars are hot on the inside, but they have cool surfaces. And the cool surfaces, the hydrogen atoms in the surface will absorb light of certain wavelengths. It's quantum mechanics. So an atom can only absorb a photon with this wavelength or this wavelength, but not anything in between. It's discrete. Now, you notice that some lines are broader than others. That's because in a dense environment, if you just had one atom by itself, it would, it would absorb a photon with exactly this wavelength and nothing else. But once you put it in an environment where it's getting run into by other atoms, I like to think of it as like rebounding a basketball, you know, and you've got three people pushing on you as you try to jump. It messes up what you're trying to do. And this, this particle is trying, this atom is trying to absorb a photon, but it's being pushed on by other particles. And so it accepts a photon that's a little different wavelength. And so due to the interactions with the plasma, the other atoms, it gets broadened. So the denser the atmosphere of the star, the broader these lines get. And the more massive the white dwarf, the denser its atmosphere. So we can use the width of these lines to get the mass of the white dwarf. Now, of course, if you were to do a more science kind of plot of this, you'd want to say, well, how much light am I getting as I make a plot across this? And it would look like this. So here is an atom uh, or a frequency or a wavelength of light that likes to get absorbed. And you see there's a width to the line and there's a width to these other lines. And the broader this width is, the higher the mass of the white dwarf. The problem is we think that our theory that tells us this says, oh, well, this should be a 0.8 solar mass white dwarf. Really, it should be a 1.0 solar mass white dwarf. So we think there's a systematic offset with our theory. So what we'd like to do is try to measure star stuff on Earth and where we really know the conditions 
and see what the atomic lines really look like. So that brings me to the Z machine at Sandia National Labs. Uh, this is a beautiful picture of the Z machine. It's what's called a pulsed power machine. So like lots of things in physics, one, one, one thing I share with physicists is, is I like to blow things up, you know? And uh, physicists love to blow things up. Um, and so what they do is they store a bunch of power and release it all at once. So these, this is about two thirds of the size of a football field here. And these are capacitors. And you typically think of capacitors as tiny little things inside your radio. But this is a size of a refrigerator. And so there's 38 of these refrigerator capacitors buried in an oil tank um, as a dielectric. And they store up energy and they release it all at once. And all these sparks and arcs that you're looking at is the tiny, tiny fraction, 0.1% of the energy that didn't go where it was supposed to. The other 99.9% .9 got focused down into the center and is heating something up to two or three million degrees. And in fact, recently in the last year or two at, at Sandia National Labs, they've had a breakthrough, and they're actually able to do a little bit of fusion with this technique. It's turned out to be better than anybody expected because the instabilities that occur happen to compress things more rather than delaying it. So there's, there's talk of building a larger machine for that purpose. But they contacted us. How lucky can you get? These guys came through town in about 2009 and said, you know, we're doing some experiments and we'd like to measure some atomic data. Would you be interested in participating? And we said, yes, <laughs> is there a catch? The reason for it was is with the uh, new Department of Energy director, he said that he wanted the national labs that do a lot of defense work to spend 10% of their time doing fundamental science because it's good for everybody. Uh, and so they were looking for fundamental science things. And fundamental science means it doesn't help them build a weapon. It doesn't help them with communications. It doesn't help them build a defense thing. It's just fundamental science. And so we said, yeah, we'd like to put hydrogen in a canister, heat it up to 15,000 degrees, and measure the spectral lines that we see in it. And they said, sure thing. <laughs> so talk about great. Yeah, exactly. It's not usually that easy. So here is a brief timeline of pulsed power, starting with Nikola Tesla. You probably heard of him from the Tesla automobiles. Quite a guy, uh, up to the Z machine. So he started in the 1900s. This is a picture of his laboratory. And notice the sparks going here, and notice him sitting there. <laughs> so Tesla was sort of P.T. Barnum-like in his showmanship. This is a time exposure photograph. He did not sit there as this was happening. They exposed that either before or afterwards. <laughs> but if you notice, the roof here, you may not be able to see, but it, his entire workshop is made of wood. It eventually burned down. <laughs> so he definitely did not meet the health and human standards uh, of today with this device. But anyway, it's the same idea. Store power up, discharge it, make lightning. And here at the Z machine, they refurbished in the early 2000s to make it more powerful. They can, within a nanosecond, deliver about 26 mega amps of, of current to a central thing about like this. It creates a shock wave in a cylinder, and that causes the gas to get compressed, and it, it shocks itself when it gets compressed into a ball and heats up to about 3 million degrees. And they actually get out fusion products, too. They can make it hotter, they can make it cooler by tuning how fast they compress things. It's a marvelous device. We're so lucky to be working with these guys. And I must say, it's a little like, I remember reading about Feynman when he was on the panel to investigate the Challenger disaster. He said there was a four-star general on the panel, and he'd always been kind of skeptical of military people. You know, he's like, they always want to steal our stuff and classify it. And he said his experience from working with this general was how incredibly thoughtful and deep thinking uh, people like him could be. And he said it totally changed his view of the military and made him and feel much better about things. Our working with these guys at Sandia is the exact same thing. I can't believe how good they are at what they do and how well they understand what they do. Here's a top-down photo of the same thing so you can see the capacitors much better. This is with the lights off during the one nanosecond that it fires. So I'll show you a movie in a minute where the lights are on so you don't see any sparks. 
Um, uh, but here's our grad student. People usually laugh at this because of his mustache. Um, he's the other secret weapon that the national labs really like collaborating with us for. The national labs are separate. You know, they have security problems. They aren't associated with universities. It's actually a problem for them to recruit new talent. You know, because new talent may want to go into business and data mining or, or whatever, or astronomy. And so what they did is they made this project that's both laboratory and astrophysics, got our astronomy grad student interested in it, and now he is a postdoc at Sandia National Labs and probably going to stay there. So this for them is what they're really interested in, uh, is getting people involved. And I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's a great thing. Everybody wins. All right, let's see if I can get this to work. I haven't had the greatest track record with movies. So again, there's not much to see, but there'll be some flashing lights that go off that says it's gonna fire in about a second. So there we go, and see everything shake. So what it does when it does that, and I've stood outside the door as this happens, the whole building shakes. If you stand at the window and look out, and it's, it's in Albuquerque, I don't know if anybody's been there, but it's basically dirt. <laughs> They're out near the mountains and everything is dry you can see the seismic wave propagating away because it kicks up dirt. And there's a nearby building where the waves are somehow focused and it shakes tiles off the, uh, uh, about the third floor. And so it's a very impressive event, you know? I mean, in astronomy, we're really used to selling our stuff as cool. These guys need to do a better job of selling their stuff as cool, because it is cool. Um, all right, and here's some of the data we get. So the, two, the, the part where it's two million degrees in the center, we don't care about that. But what it does is it gives us x-rays that travel out from that about a meter, and we place our gas cell, and it heats it up to about 15,000 degrees. Now, the, the z-pinch of x-rays only lasts about two nanoseconds. So it's at two million degrees for two nanoseconds. But then it heats up our experiment, and our experiment stays warm a lot longer we get like 100 nanoseconds or 200 nanoseconds out of it. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second, so it's not a lot of time. So you really kind of have to know what you're doing to, uh, to notice as it goes by. <laughs> so here is a much, much slowed down movie of the spectrum we get uh, as we let things go off. So those are laser bursts that you can ignore them. They're just for calibration. And then all of a sudden it'll get bright, boom, it heated up our gas cell, and these lines right here are the lines that we're interested in measuring. Uh, so you can see that things are cooling off, but actually it's the walls of our container that are cooling off, but our gas is continuing to get hotter. Uh, and let me try and rerun that. You can see that even though the, the background level is uh, cooling off, the lines are getting wider, which means the the, the number of electrons, the density of electrons is going up. So boom, there it goes. And that line there, you can see, is actually getting wider with time. And so as time goes on, we're actually able to sample a whole bunch of densities. We can scan through a whole range of densities of what our hydrogen lines look like with a single shot. And of course, saying it in the best way possible, there was a, a, a genius of a, an experimentalist called Visa back in the early 70s, and he did very high quality data, not as dense as we're doing, but very high quality. But he would, had to scan in wavelength, so it took him about nine months to make one measurement at one density at a whole bunch of wavelengths. And we're able to get like 20 or 30 density points in 100 nanoseconds. So we feel pretty good about ourselves. He still is the gold standard at lower densities. But, uh, but we're definitely pushing into higher densities. So here's a, a good average spectrum of what we see. Um, this is one of the lines, and again, the wider it is, the denser the plasma that is forming it is. And we measure all of these lines in a white dwarf, and we average them together to get um, an indication of how massive our white dwarf is. And right now, we still have preliminary data, so I can't give you a number. Uh, one of the things with working with the national labs is it turns out they don't like to um, put out results that might get revised later. They like to be right the first time, which I kind of understand. Um, in astronomy, we like to get stuff out fast so that we can talk about it. 
but it looks like that there's at least a five or 10 percent difference in mass due to the atomic physics in these lines. And our grad student Thomas Gomez said it could be even larger than that. Um, but we can't, we can't quote it yet. So here, this is a totally cheesy plot, I apologize. But it's a spectrum that I just showed you, the red dashed line, and the other spectrum is a white dwarf star. So they really are the same. I mean, the, the depth of here is different, but if you look at the location and the shape of the lines, it really is the same. White dwarfs are slightly more complicated because when you look at a white dwarf, you see different depths. And so you're, you're getting an average over depth in the, in the atmosphere. So you're seeing some cool regions and some hot regions. Whereas when we do our laboratory experiment, we design it so that it's one temperature and one density. Um, and so the heights of the lines are not gonna match, but you can see the atomic physics is about the same in both cases. All right, well, uh, this is my last slide. So the current status is we've had three PhD students in our group work on this project. Rouse Falcon, who's now permanent staff there, he's now a Sandia postdoctoral fellow, he studied hydrogen lines. Uh, Thomas Gomez, is a PhD, he'll get his PhD within the next year, and he's our resident theorist. He's, uh, he's hard to talk to. <laughs> you sit down with him and he just starts talking about quantum mechanics. And you're like, okay, Thomas, all right. Really, really funny guy, super enthusiastic. It's, it's amazing how different people are. I, talk, I tried to talk him out of this project so hard because I say, you don't understand how hard this is. You have to model this, you have to model this, you have to model that. And I thought I'd convinced him and he said, yeah, you know? <laughs> And one of our collaborators told us a couple of years ago, he said, he's now the world expert in this. There's like one or two other guys in the whole world who are as good as he is. And he's still two years from graduating. You know? So he can get a job in any national lab he wants uh, when he graduates. And we have a guy named Mark Schoble, who's German-American citizen. His training is an engineer, and he is super precise. He's just a joy to work with. We just wrote a uh, proposal, an NSF proposal, and I send it to Mark for proofreading. <laughs> it was fantastic. I never knew my writing was so terrible. <laughs> it was beautiful. I mean, he wouldn't just say, well, you misspelled this word, you need a comma, you need this. He'd say, this sentence is not logically connected to that sentence. This, this therefore does not work because this does not follow from that. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we're writing 15 pages, and it's anyway. He's fantastic. He's going to do the. He's doing the experiments. He's doing helium and carbon, and it sounds crazy, but a lot of these quantities have been calculated theoretically, but not measured in the lab. And theory is good, but only when you don't have an observation to go with it. Um, that means there's a 50% chance of it being wrong. And we hope to provide this uh, information to the community on hydrogen lines in the next one to two years. And then all astronomers will be able to use it. And hopefully we'll revise the mass of our white dwarfs. Thanks very much. <laughs>